Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 66 to 70. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 66, it says, given the two similar molecules below, which will have the lower pKa after deprotonation of the alcohol group and why? So we have two carboxylic acids given. Which one has the lower pKa? Lower pKa means that it's a stronger acid. So which one is a stronger acid or which one has a more stabilized conjugate base? So we're talking about deprotonation of a carboxylic acid, which means that proton is lost and we get a negative charge on this oxygen. The oxygen does not like the negative charge, so we know that we have residents residents donating into this pi system. So the negative charge is shared between these two oxygens. However, with the carboxylic acid on the right, we also have a nitrogen present. And we know because of it being electronegative and because of the inductive effect, it's going to pull electron density towards itself. So now it's pulling that negative charge towards itself. And so these oxygens feel the effect of the negative charge even less. And so we have an overall more stable conjugate base, which means this molecule is more likely to be deprotonated. So that just made our carboxylic acid more acidic. So therefore we're going to say the one on the right is more acidic or has a lower pKa. And it's not because of the option C. Option C is saying the right molecule because the nitrogen group will accept a proton, stabilizing the conjugate base. No, sure it can accept a proton and undergo hydrogen bonding, but that's kind of irrelevant to what we're talking about, which is distributing that negative charge and stabilizing the conjugate base. And option D is mentioning this. It's saying because the nitrogen group is electron withdrawing, which stabilizes the negatively charged conjugate base, this makes more sense as and is directly related to how likely the carboxylic acid is going to be deprotonated. <clears throat> In question 67, it says 1,2-dimethylcyclopentene reacts with hydrochloric acid to form a compound. How many stereoisomers are created as products in this reaction? So we have this reactant reacting with HCl, and we're asked how many stereoisomers are created. So cyclopentene is going to look like this. So the cyclopent tells you that it's a ring with five carbons, and then the ene tells you that there's a double bond. And then we have a dimethyl system. So that's where we have the two methyls. Now reacting with HCl, what's going to happen is at one carbon, we're going to get hydrogen, and at the other, we're going to get the chloride. And we don't know how this addition is going to happen. So we could have at one carbon hydrogen coming from the top or the bottom, and then at the other, same thing with the chloride top or bottom, which means that we can have either R or S stereochemistry for both of the carbons. So for either of the carbons, meaning that there are four total combinations. For example, we could get RR if we're talking about the two carbons. RS, so R at one and S at the other. We could get SR, and finally we could get SS. So those are the four combinations or four stereoisomers we can get from this reaction. <clears throat> In question 68, it says a particular molecule is under study. Based on various data, it is discerned that the a particular carbon is an R stereocenter. Which of the following can be confirmed about the molecule, assuming that the molecule contains only one stereocenter? So we know that we have a molecule with only one stereocenter, and that stereocenter is R. So since there's only one stereocenter, we aren't worried about things such as the compound being a meso compound, which is a compound with chiral centers, but it overall has a plane of symmetry, which cancels out optical activity. So since there's only one stereocenter, we know the compound overall definitely does have optical activity. However, we're told that it's an R stereocenter. And we need to keep in mind that R and S, these labels are the absolute stereochemistry of the carbon. So it's just a kind of nomenclature we've given, and we set up certain rules for how we determine that nomenclature. But R and S doesn't directly translate into which direction this, this molecule will rotate light. So it doesn't tell you exactly what the polarized light direction is, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. For that, we can also have a plus or minus symbol. So for example, something might be R plus or R minus, and then the same thing goes for an S stereocenter, and a plus or minus is actually telling you whether you're rotating light clockwise or counterclockwise, and this is something which is determined experimentally. 
So option A is saying the molecule will rotate like clockwise, and A and B are incorrect because we need to determine this experimentally. Just the information in the question, just telling us that it's an R series center, isn't enough data to determine which way it rotates light. Option C is saying it will not result in any light rotation. That's incorrect. If there's only one stereo center and we're told that it's R, there's definitely going to be some optical activity. And so D is the correct answer. None of the above. We can't fully determine which way light is rotated. We have to do this experimentally. In question 69, we're asked how many hydrogen peaks would the molecule 3 ethyl 2 methyl pentane show in its proton NMR? So this compound, how many uh, peaks? In proton NMR. So first of all we have to draw the compound. One, two, three, four, five. So it's a pentane, so five carbon main chain. At the two position we have a methyl. At the three position we have an ethyl. So it will look like this and then we just have to draw in all of the different hydrogens and then see which hydrogens are under a similar environment those ones are going to show up as the same peak and those that are unique from each other they are you know unique peaks and then we see the unique environments and see how many overall peaks we're going to get so that is it those are all the protons the first type of peak we see is this methyl group and this methyl group <clears throat> both of these are methyl groups and they're connected to that same type of carbon so it's one carbon that they're connected to. So like this carbon over here that has one hydrogen on it and it's a overall tertiary carbon. They're both under that similar environment. And so these two proton types are going to show the same peak. Next, we can do this type of proton. Hold on, let me change the color. Yeah, there's a unique type of proton. So there's nothing else that's really quite like that. And then we have this type of proton which is also unique, so that's three so far. And now these guys are also equivalent because they have on one side a methyl group, on the other side a tertiary type carbon. So these two carbon types are going to be similar as well, so that's four so far. And finally, these two methyl groups that are connected to a carbon with two hydrogens on it so secondary carbon, those are also in a similar environment. So one, two, three, four, five. We have five overall peaks for this type of, for this uh, compound. So for this question, just do a lot of different practice questions with NMR. So either looking at the peak and trying to figure out the structure or looking at the structure and thinking how many peaks we have. So just look at every type of, every type of carbon and see what's connected next to it, and then see if there are similarities. So once again, these blue ones were similar because they're methyl groups and they're connected to that tertiary carbon. And then over here, these purple ones were similar because they're methyl and they're connected to that secondary carbon. So they're different from the other methyl groups that are present on this molecule. And yeah, this kind of just comes with a lot of practice. But that's it for this question, five peaks. In question 70, it says that thin layer chromatography or TLC involves the separation of compounds based on Differences in polarity. The compounds interact differently with the solvent and the solid matrix, resulting in a different rate of travel along the solvent front as it wicks along the surface of the solid matrix. Consider a TLC experiment using a solid matrix of silica with diethyl ether as a solvent. Three compounds are dissolved in the ether. Tyrosine, which has a structure shown below, so it's an amino acid, benzaldehyde, and phenol. So I will draw benzaldehyde. It is a benzene with an aldehyde on it and then phenol looks like this so an alcohol with that benzene group and we're asked in which order will the compounds follow the solvent front so the first part is just kind of like a background on TLC you should already know this for organic chemistry the actual question is saying we have solid phase of silica Diethyl ether is our solvent, the mobile phase. And then we have these three compounds. Structures are all drawn. And we're asked for the order in which they will follow the solvent front. So silica is a very pol polar compound. And so our stationary phase is very polar. So 
the most polar substance will stick to the stationary phase. Diethyl ether it is also a pretty polar um, solvent, but it's less polar than silica would be. So whatever is most polar of the three compounds that we're talking about will stick to the silica more so than moving with the, the mobile phase. And therefore that spot will be at the bottom as the solvent moves up the TLC. So the one that's at the top is going to be the least polar and the one at the bottom is going to be the most polar. So the order we just have to figure out is, so we're going from top to bottom. The order is just going to be whichever one is most polar is at the bottom. And so between these three, the ones which have the capability of hydrogen bonding, they're going to be more polar than those that do not. So benzaldehyde, if we're talking about top to bottom, it's going to be number one at the top because it's not capable of hydrogen bonding. It doesn't have you know, a hydrogen connected to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluoride. So this one is going to be the least polar and stick to the silica the least relative to the others. So it's going to be at the top. And then between the phenyl and tyrosine, tyrosine is more polar. And that is because we have this group over here capable of hydrogen bonding as well as this group and this group. Whereas in the phenyl, we have one group, the alcohol group, which is capable of hydrogen bonding. But of course, tyrosine is going to hydrogen bond a lot more so and overall is going to be more polar. So going from top to bottom, D is the correct answer. So benzaldehyde is going to stick to silica the least and move all the way to the top and or move further to the top than the other compounds. Phenyl is in the middle. Tyrosine is going to be closest to the bottom. And that's the correct answer for this question. That's it for the videos. Sorry, that's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description. In that course, we go through a lot more questions like this and go through all the different answers, explaining why each option is correct or incorrect so that you develop the right type of thinking for the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.